Hello again for those of you who may have seen us a few moments ago. We want to welcome you again to our Schiller Institute uh, webcast for Saturday, December 19th. Um, we apologize for the technical problem, assuming it was a technical problem. And we'd just like to say again that we are returning here a few days before the beginning of winter. And the question for this winter in America is, is has the Constitution of the United States been reduced to just being a noble piece of paper? We have a circumstance in which the election of 2020 has been contested by the President of the United States, who continues to do so. Some believe this to be a rash, uh, irresponsible, if not even crazy action. And others believe that, in fact, the Constitution of the United States is the final authority of government, uh, not any particular electoral procedure. But the issue is not, does not lie in that domain. Uh, we would suggest, uh, as we did last week with our Schiller Institute conference, which we held, which was a two-day conference, you can get that conference at the Schiller Institute uh, website, uh, we talked about the, co the title of the co conference and the uh, conception was the world after the United States 2020 presidential election, creating a world based on reason. The creation of a world based on reason was the very premise of the United States Constitution and particularly its preamble, that it was possible to promote the general welfare of an entire society without that being done at the cost of any individual within it. And while there may have been imperfections in the people who proposed that, there was no imperfection in the notion put forward. And in fact, as the uh, statement begins, we, the people of the United States, in order to create a more perfect union that the notion of perfection and perfectibility was the very root of what was the United States. It's important to recognize that because it's the oldest republic of its type in history, and it's uh, one of the only republics that's based on an actual conception of mankind that's put forward in the founding document. What we want to do today is we want to talk about a way for the uh, individual citizens, for people like yourself and myself, to think about our relationship to this present moment in the United States. To do that, we're going to refer to a discussion that Lyndon LaRouche, who ran for president eight times and thought about it uh, quite a bit, uh, a discussion that he uh, conducted. We, we want to play a, a short excerpt first, which simply gives you an idea about that discussion, uh, and then uh, I'll, well, we'll, we'll then make a comment about it. There is no mathematics which will ever give you, generate a discovery of a physical principle, mm -hmm. and never has been. Always you go outside mathematics to discover physical principles. You discover them in the area of artistic uh, yeah. creativity. That's where creativity lies, in the artistic creativity. Now, the reason we're beginning there is, as some of you know, a few days ago, we celebrated the 250th birthday of Ludwig Beethoven. Uh, so what you might want to ask is, well, wait a minute, what's that got to do with the Constitution of the United States? Fundamentally, the Constitution of the United States is a composition. It's a poetic composition, and it's a poetic composition which has been accessed by people, uh, presidents, such as Abraham Lincoln, who understood that poetic principle as being the basis of the Constitution. Not its positive laws, not its amendments, not the Bill of Rights, but the conception of the composition of the Constitution itself. We're going to now return to uh, what you just saw, and we're going to have this introduced. The next segment that you're going to see will be introduced by Jason Ross, uh, who will under, uh, tell you a little bit about that little segment you just saw. So this interview of Lyndon LaRouche from a decade ago takes up what LaRouche refers to as the basement. So this was a scientific and economic research group staffed by reasonably young people and directly overseen by LaRouche himself. Our workspace gave rise to the name the basement, literally. Uh, I was a member of this group working with LaRouche for about a decade. As a brief background to understand the context of the video that you just saw and are about to see more of, this basement process worked on a narrow path of the greatest scientific discoveries in human history, beginning with the first modern scientist, Johannes Kepler, moving on through Leibniz, Gauss, Riemann, the great geniuses that made the developments in science that brought us modern economy possible. This video dates from a period of work that was expanding on how Carl Gauss 
discovered the orbit of what we would now call an asteroid, Ceres, based on observations made over a pretty short time and over a reasonably small patch uh, of the sky. The way that Gauss understood the nature of the space, or of the dynamic that the planets and asteroids moved in around the Sun, this gave rise to the concept of the tensor that Lyndon LaRouche will discuss here. So I'd like to start with what you've initiated with the basement. Well, first thing to understand, right, we've, it, the idea we've used a tensor is an approach, it's a tactic, it's a strategy. It's also an intellectual strategy. It is not a principle of physical science. Mm -hmm. It is a technique which was used to circumvent some of the difficulties the human mind has today in trying to deal with certain kinds of scientific problems. The typification of this, of course, is the case of the asteroid belt, in the case of Gauss's discovery of the asteroid mm -hmm. belt, in which Gauss actually used the tensor concept to do it, but did not reveal that in, in full detail mm -hmm. to his contemporaries. What he did instead is he gave the result and then gave an example of how it might have happened mm. as an illustration. It was only later with the work of Bernhard Riemann that the concept of the tensor was developed as a full system. Today, we look back to what Gauss actually accomplished with the uh, belt, the asteroid belt. Mm -hmm. And we look back at that and we trace the idea of the tensor from that period. But we really, if to understand the tensor, you have to go to a still higher level than the tensor itself. Mm -hmm. Because it is not a principle of physics. It's a principle of how the mind can be induced to trick itself into understanding which it otherwise would not understand. The true expression of this is Riemannian physics, Riemannian physical geometry. Same thing. Now, the other issue here is that, uh, co compared to another point I'll make, which will shock some people on music, uh, but the uh, problem here is that the most people think of creativity today as mm -hmm. having something to do with mathematics. Right. Uh, and that's a fraud. No, no principle of physical science was ever defined by mathematics. The example of this is the attack on Leibniz after his death mm -hmm. by this whole crowd of clowns who uh, denied the existence of the infinitesimal, the Leibnizian right. infinitesimal, uh, which meant that for them, the very factor of change which determines the organization of the physical universe for them did not exist. And therefore, they, they started a process in modern times of a completely mathematical interpretation of physics. And in a sense, they're starting with a dead universe. Well, it's even worse because yeah. you have the case of David Hilbert, who was morally one of the least objectionable of these characters, mm -hmm. as compared with that filthy piece of crap, Bertrand Russell. Russell. Uh, that Hilbert was, was of that school. Mm -hmm. And his effort in the, at the turn of the century, the turn of the last century, he failed completely. His ass essential arguments were proved by failure to him in his time. Mm -hmm. uh, and all people who depended upon mathematics as a standard of physical science have failed inherently. But the Bertrand Russell, Russell followers mm -hmm. are the very worst. Now you have, to, you have to understand a couple of things about the human mind first. Mm -hmm. What is the method which is responsible for the dominant trend in mathematical physics as taught today? It essentially is the belief that the science is essentially mathematical, mm -hmm. that physical science is mathematical. Now, yeah. since in terms of economics, no economist who believes in the liberal system can possibly explain economics from a physical standpoint, yeah. they use a statistical method to, to explain. And every time they have forecast, against what I have forecast, yeah. I've been correct and they failed. Why do they fail? Because they're stupid? No, they're stupefied. Mm -hmm. They're stupefied by the admiration of this kind of mathematics. Mm -hmm. They hate Leibniz. Mm -hmm. They believe in that mathematics is the determinant of physics. Now, here's where the fun comes. There is no mathematics which will ever give you, generate a discovery of a physical principle, mm -hmm. and never has been. Always you go outside mathematics to discover physical principles. 
you would discover them in the area of artistic uh, yeah. creativity. That's where creativity lies, in the artistic creativity. Now, you, to understand this connection simply for the purposes here, you have to say that a tensor and a, a Bach series of preludes and right. fugues are one of the same thing. Mm -hmm. The music does not lie in the tensor. Right. Uh, the mu because if you play, the, if, as many people perform Bach, Bach fugues, they, they're mechanical. Well, there are people who say that the counterpoint can be reduced to a mathematical system. It can't be. Uh, of course not, but that's, no, that's the problem. Because the, point, the, the essence of the fugue, of course, is a discontinuity. You take, a ser you take an overlay of development of, a, of a, what you might call a, 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 a scale, mm -hmm. and now you counterpose it to another scale. Yeah. Now, if you think of these scales in terms of the ranges of the respective human singing voices, mm -hmm. down from soprano through tenor, delto, and so forth, huh? down to double bass, essentially, huh? yeah. uh, basso profundo, huh? right. all the way down there. And you find out that these, these like we, did, we were doing this, uh, having fun with this the other day, in the Opus 69 of Beethoven. Yes. All right. The uniqueness is, of course, it's the A major key. Yeah. The A major key has certain anomalies vis-a-vis -vis the piano, which are crucial in making this thing work. When played against the cello. That's exactly. Yes. The yes. piano against the cello, because yeah. the piano has a different logic in yes. its construction, even when it's well-tuned. Yes. And the A major is, a, is, a, is not C major. Mm -hmm. And when you have an instrument which is tuned and designed to A major, and has the peculiarities of A major, and you play that against this piano, which is essentially a C major instrument, yeah. uh, bass, yeah. then you've got, you've got ironies. Well, and it's in these ironies or the anomalies that you actually begin to see the development of singularities, which is where the creativity lies. Well, how did, Bach, how did Beethoven understand this, to understand this A major principle in respect to that six, Opus 69, which is an absolutely unique piece yeah. in its own implications? It goes back to Bach's suites, which mm -hmm. also I give you a hint. And the box suites are, actually, suites are actually a development of the well-tempered system. Now this has another precondition which you've insisted upon, which is the proper tuning and registration as physical properties of the voice, but also as existent in creativity or discoverable uh, by creativity. That's where creativity comes in. Yeah. And we had a lot of fun with the Ave Verum Corpus, where our singers who were singing the notes properly were not singing the music. <laughs> And the idea that you sing the musical score is where the mistake comes in often. Because you have to transport yourself from the score to itself and to say, what is the intention which underlies this use of scores? And now you have to, you have to stop singing the notes. Mm -hmm. Now you have to sing the music. And the music does not appear on the, on the, on the uh, printed notes mm -hmm. in any way. So th this is where creativity comes in. And the ex best example of this, of this principle, of the relationship of the tensor as, yeah. a, as a mathematical procedure to music, is, lies exactly in the Bach preludes and fugues. That's the most explicit yeah. wor working through of this. Now, people who play the notes on the, on the 24, et cetera, fu uh, fu the, the well-tempered clavier, yeah, the fugues, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, don't make a mess of it. Everyone who plays the notes makes a mess of it because they don't see the irony. Mm -hmm. They don't see what lies between the notes, mm -hmm. as every great composer and every great performer understood. You sing between the notes. And the counterpoint then is not mathematical relations, but it's actually that process of change that, that the mind has to pick but, up. Well, is that, is, that's the reason I insisted that our people who are working on music clean up their act on the, on the Mozart Abiferum Corpus. Mm -hmm because the mechanical performance of that, according note by note, and voice, voicing by voicing, ends up in a dead end, because you are simply recycling mm -hmm. a statement with some little touch here and there, and there's no conclusion. Mm. You, it's repetition, not conclusion. Mm -hmm. And yet, if you do it properly and understand Bach, uh, Mozart's intention, there's a conclusion, and the last part is a conclusion. And it's highly ironic. Exactly. Yeah. Just and uh, you know there are other things like that. So they were missing the point. And my point was to get people to get away from this so-called literal singing of notes, 
to understand the intention of the composer of a great piece of work. And Mozart was one of the greatest in composers because of his skill in doing just exactly this. What is it, uh, you talk about creativity per se when you're looking now at the tensor and also at questions of, of counterpoint, uh, physical chemistry. Mm -hmm. where, does it, where does this insight come from? It comes from art. Mm -hmm. It comes from classical art. The human imagination, the organized, validated form of human imagination, and you have to live through this process. You ha it has to become a part of you, and then you know what to do. Well, when, when Gauss faced a problem in, in the a challenge with the orbit of Ceres, <laughs> what is this little thing that he's got a few observations on? How does it work? Nobody could figure out how to do it. Now, because of his training, which is actually a reflection of Abraham Kessner, mm -hmm. who was an advocate of both Bach and, and Beethoven, Le uh, Bach Leibniz. and Leibniz. Huh? Yeah. He, uh, when Kessner graduated from university in Leipzig, he devoted his life by declaration to furthering the work of Leibniz and Bach. Yeah, and Leibniz. this was the fight of the 18th century, where you had, after Kessner, his students Lessing and Mendelssohn joined in the same fight to defend Leibniz and Bach from the uh, takeover in the court of Friedrich the Great by this, this French crowd of this perverts. Con this continues through Brahms, through the yeah. classical composers, as opposed to the Romantics, who are pieces of crap. I can say that I am very glad that Dennis chose this video uh, to use today. I think that these topics just presented by LaRouche are, give a lot of food for thought, and I think it also coincides well hmm, with the uh, coincidence of opposites theme that we have been discussing recently, as in the Schiller Institute conference that we, we just held last weekend. This is the idea that when there are two competing approaches to viewing a problem, it might seem to be two different interpretations, two different vantage points, where there's a realization that the truth doesn't lie in the middle through conflict mediation in the usual sense, but through achieving a new outlook that resolves the conflict and lets us realize that we were missing the higher vantage point to understand it in. So one example of this is in escaping sense perception. The tensor is literally the way of understanding Einstein's theory of relativity. So what's relative in relativity? Einstein showed us that the world according to our senses isn't reality and that something else is. In other words, even things that seem like very simple concepts based on how we see the world, like simultaneity, the idea that two things happen at the same time in different places, Einstein showed that even that idea simply doesn't exist. That two lightning bolts that we say struck the ground at the same time, if we were flying in a plane looking down or traveling in a high-speed train as those lightning bolts struck, we actually might say, no, this one appeared first and then this one. Whereas, sitting here in a room, we'd say they're simultaneous. Who's right? Neither one, says Einstein. The tensor is a way of understanding how your perception of the world changes depending on your vantage point, you might say. Does that mean that there is no reality? No. Reality's there. The point is that the perception of it might vary depending on the, the nature of the perceiver, in Einstein's case in terms of motion and gravity and things like this. But there is a higher truth that goes beyond the senses that really is there. Here's another example of this. If I had a piece of metal and we said, how long is this uh, piece of metal? You might think that there's an answer to that. It seems reasonable. But if you heated up that piece of metal, it would expand. If you cooled it, it would contract. So how long is that metal rod? It doesn't have a length outside of the context that it's in. And the tensor is, is a way of understanding this, of getting at what's true across these variations. A couple of other reflections on, on the very profound concepts uh, LaRouche discussed here about mathematics not being the same as science. Look, no physical scientific discovery is the logical result of past knowledge. They're always an overthrowing of something in the past, sh showing that the past worldview we had wasn't only missing something, but it also included something that it should not have. So Einstein helped us realize that the idea of mass and energy being essentially separate domains was no longer true. His 
equation, the most famous equation in science, I'd say, E equals mc squared, shows a connection between energy, the E, and mass, the m. Our old view included something wrong that the higher view resolves. LaRouche brings up Leibniz and the differential. This is a way of understanding change as being an actually existing thing in the universe. If you take a snapshot of the world, you can't see the change in a snapshot. If you take a still photograph, is that car moving? Was it parked? You can't always tell from a photo in one moment. But does that mean that at that moment, the car actually isn't moving or parked? That there's no truth to that? No, of course, that there's, there's a real process that's unfolding. And Leibniz understood this by mathematically bringing in change as something that existed in between nothing and something. That this concept of change expressed itself in the world of snapshots as a magnitude smaller than any magnitude you might imagine, but still not nothing. Something and nothing, a higher concept. And then the last reflection um, before we move on I wanted to share was that at times there's different ways of viewing something and people dispute how to describe something and they're not actually talking about the thing itself. So think about whether this happens when arguments like especially like maybe when you're in middle school, people would argue essentially about words. This is an A. No, it isn't that thing. Is this a, a liberal or a conservative position? Sometimes these just end up becoming words without a meaning. So there's many ways of using mathematical words to talk about things in the universe around us. You could use a Cartesian grid where X, Y, and Z axes are separate dimensions in that way. You could also understand the world in the way of spherics, of saying how far away is something and what angle is it at from you. You can talk about the world using either of those standpoints. The way that you would describe, let's say, the motion of a planet, or the way you would describe the shape of space with Einstein's general theory of relativity, it would be different depending on which choice of axes you used. And the tensor is the thing that transcends those ways of talking about the world to get directly at what is the universe actually, that transcends a specific way of viewing it, of seeing it, or of describing it. What is that higher reality of cause. And I think that that's the, in a sense, uh, that is the, in essence, that's the most essential part of what science is, escaping sense perception, going beyond the, our eyes and our extended sensorium to discover the causes of things, and then using those causes to improve our power over nature and to work with each other. That's the basis of economics, and that's the basis of acting to improve the scientific method itself. Concepts that LaRouche saw truly as being a one. If you've just joined us, what we're doing today is we're continuing the discussion that was begun last week at our Schiller Institute conference, which was entitled, The World After the United States Election, Creating a World Based on Reason. Uh, discovering physical principles such as a cure for not merely the coronavirus, but the disease situation that allowed for the spread of it in the first place requires a significantly different kind of knowledge than we have been proceeding with. Now, the ideas we're presenting to you are, are essential to any serious permanent resolution of the present crisis. This is not a crisis of the American Constitution. It's a crisis of the moral constitution of the present generation of Americans. You have a situation in which there was a theft of a United States presidential election, a theft which was in one sense a, the descendant of a process that had been going on, well, for many decades actually, but which was punctuated uh, to our direct knowledge by the persecution and near assassination of Lyndon LaRouche, who was a presidential candidate several times in America prior to the time in which this was attempted, which was on October 6th of 1986. 400 federal, state, and local uh, troops attempted to kill him. Um, and although uh, this is known in America, uh, uh, very few people uh, defended Lyndon LaRouche at that time. And that process that began with that, uh, walking away from the need to stand up uh, against not only a criminal action, but an unconstitutional action as well, 
uh, that began a long trend downward, which has now resulted in a president yelling and screaming from the office, I have been and you have been violated. And while people hear him, people say, well, what's our recourse? We must have a recourse. There must be something we can do. But you cannot mechanically invoke the Constitution of the United States to solve a problem. There is no law or amendment or procedure that will get you out of the mess of your own mind. You look at this country we had just this year, 80,000 overdoses from drugs, 80,000 people that died of overdoses. That's one and a half times the losses in Vietnam and the entire American losses in the entire war. We're doing this every year. One, one more Vietnam hits us. Where's this come from? How do you talk about that? That tells you more about what the actual circumstances are that surround the crisis around the coronavirus than looking at the coronavirus itself. Why? Because even as that happens, in, se in several states around the United States, we either legalize all drugs uh, in, in actual law or in practice. So how does it show you that we understand uh, the general uh, welfare clause of the Constitution? To discuss this idea of significant knowledge of a completely different type, we're going to hear from two people today, Diane Sayre and Harley Schlanger. Now, Diane, uh, well, you've already seen Harley, actually, in the video uh, discussion with Lynn from 10 years earlier. Uh, Diane, who is a candidate for the United States Senate running against Chuck Schumer in New York for 2022, founded the New York City Schiller Institute Chorus back in 2014 following the killing of Eric Garner in Staten Island. Uh, and what, the reason that we have them here is to discuss this idea of politics as art. We're going to start off with Diane, who will be telling us not only about last week's conference and the principles that were being discussed there, but sort of why this is at the core of what we call politics and political practice. So, Diane? Yeah, thanks. Well, I think um, one of the things I want to start with is this question of Beethoven, because people, as people may have asked when they heard Lyndon LaRouche in his discussion with Harley that we just listened to, well, what is, I thought LaRouche was a politician or, or an economist. So what is he doing? Why does he have all these ideas about Beethoven? Now, interestingly, the uh, principal violinist of the Amadeus String Quartet, Norbert Breinin, who was a dear friend of Lyndon LaRouche, said that Lynn uh, was someone who knew more about music than he did. And one of the people that he finally felt could understand his insights into certain musical compositional principles, like the question of the motif uh, development in, in the whole. So on that question, Beethoven, um, I don't think it's arbitrary. That is, people who love mankind want to do things that are beautiful, that uplift mankind. And I have a few quotes from Beethoven today, but I'm just going to read you one thing. I found it somewhat amusing. Of course, he had to deal with the horrors of Napoleon and uh, a kind of a fascist control in Europe, not just uh the royal system of royalty and your future is basically what bloodline you're born into, but actual oppression, troops in the streets, and so on. At one point, he writes, uh, here, various important people have been locked up. It is said that a revolution is about to break out. But I believe that so long as an Austrian can get his brown ale and his little sausages, he is not likely to revolt. So a very astute political insight from Ludwig van Beethoven, who people thought um, was just a composer, just a composer, okay, and musician, and I would say universal genius, uh, and I'll have more in a second. What we took up on the fourth panel, uh, which heard a keynote from Jacques Cheminade, who is a longtime associate of Lyndon LaRouche in France, who's run uh, for president of France three times and is the head of a party there, Solidarité et Progrès. Um, he raised the question, and Helga took it up in a different way, which is how is it that you can have a population which is so advanced? I mean, take, this is me speaking now, but we're going to have China 
the UAE and the United States all landing various um, landers and rovers and experimental uh, instruments on the surface of Mars. They're all going to arrive there in February of 2021. So given that we have that level of scientific advancement, how could it be that we have 260 million people on the planet who are threatened with death by starvation? Is starvation something that is that hard to deal with? Uh, or how could it be that we've had one point, nearly 1.7 million people die of the coronavirus when we actually have the capacity to be getting to Mars in this way? And Helga took this up um, from another standpoint, talking about the people that she had observed to really develop to become beautiful souls we're in almost every case touched by a beautiful soul, a universal genius of perhaps a previous generation, either a teacher or someone they knew, or I think in some cases, people you may not know personally, but you know their mind, the way that Lyndon LaRouche by a very early age got to know the mind of Leibniz, for example, or Helga described the impact of Schiller on her as a young girl, and that this becomes part of your identity so that you actually address this. Uh, and I really just would encourage people to watch this fourth panel because it was a dialogue between Helga, Jacques, and a group of young people who are constituting an international youth movement um, all over the, the planet, taking up various interesting con uh, discussions. One of the things during the panel that evoked the most controversy was a question about chess, which I think gets at what Lynn was saying earlier about how you can have all the notes right, but the music is missing. The music is wrong. The performance is wrong, even if it's technically perfect. Because what is it that distinguishes actual creativity. Now on that, I wanted to um, share with you from Beethoven, uh, again, how he thought about this and how connected he was to the world, to the fate of mankind, even as his art, in a sense, was connected to something definitely not in the physical domain. He writes, you know yourself that a man's spirit, the active creative spirit, must not be tied down to the wretched necessity necessities of life. And this business robs me of many other things conducive to a happy existence. I have been compelled, compelled and still am compelled to set bounds to my inclination, nay more, to the duty which I had imposed on myself i.e. to work by means of my art for human beings in distress. I shall not say anything to you about our monarchs and so forth, or about our monarchies and so forth, so the papers report everything to you. And then later uh, he says, before my departure for the Elysian fields, I must leave behind me what the eternal sp spirit has infused into my soul and bids me complete. Why, I feel as if I hardly composed more than a few notes. I wish you every success in your efforts on behalf of art, for after all, only art and science give us intimations and hopes of a higher life. So it it was not some fluke, which is what the Congress of Cultural Freedom and people committed to imposing a dark age upon us, that Beethoven composed the music that he composed. He was driven by a sense of necessity to uplift mankind and therefore to fight for a certain degree of perfection in what he was producing. Now, I want to share with you something from Lyndon LaRouche, and people uh, have seen or hopefully will order this book of LaRouche's writings, Think Like Beethoven, where he says, <clears throat> and this is 
actually from May of 1977. LaRouche writes, there are no unreachable summits for man since everything in existence conforms to the lawful ordering of the universe. There is always a method and a path which lead efficiently to the summit of the Everests of all kinds. These possibilities are mainly matters of technology and knowledge. What we are able to do is limited by the progress of our technology. Whether we can successfully achieve what available technology implies is a matter of knowing the appropriate path and mustering the enduring determination to follow that course. On these very premises, we may regard human colonies on Mars as a task of the century beginning about 1990 to 95. You can see we've lost a great deal of time on this. Uh, for the same reason, the mastery of Beethoven is something we should have been capable of effecting before this. Beethoven was a product of the same European culture that produced our American Revolution and established our Republic. So if you think of the United States, of our Republic, uh, in the way that Lyndon LaRouche conceived of it and Beethoven, then obviously there's a much higher standard to which we must hold ourselves and a standard which is tied to the question of the general welfare of mankind as a whole, as a universal principle. And what Helga brought into this panel is, uh, aside from that discussion, she referenced what Schiller describes as, as a difference between a savage and a barbarian. That is a savage uh, is a person who perhaps never knew more advanced culture, never had a higher standard of living. Someone in some aboriginal tribe uh, stuck somewhere, but uh, Mr. LaRouche would argue that even many of these cultures were actually a result of some kind of collapse imposed on someone that was progressing. But a barbarian, and what we find much more offensive, and you can think about it among people that you know, uh, what's much more offensive is someone who has attained a certain degree of culture, of literacy, of standard of living, and then they behave like a disgusting pig. And that is something that really gets at you. It's the most kind of ugly thing imaginable. And that sort of a question is how do you if you have a society that seems relatively quote unquote advanced, how do you uh, transform people from their barbaric state into becoming civilized human beings? And I think part of that really is this question of, of agape as we hear in Beethoven, that you develop a love, the love of God, the love of mankind, the love of truth, the love of beauty. Because when you love in that way, it's active. It's not something where you're thinking about yourself. Shakespeare comes to mind, but thou contracted to thy own, thine own bright eyes, feedest thy light's flame on self-substantial fuel. That is the selfishness where you consume yourself versus as you uh, love in this agapic sense, then you become actually a very big person, a universal person. A nation based on those principles is a nation which can bring a certain quality of nobility and dignity to the planet. So uh, as was said earlier, in 2014, about this time of year, um, we organized a sing-along of Handel's Messiah in response to actually the the grand jury decision in the Garner case that no crime had been committed in the death by strangulation of Eric Garner at the hands of the uh, police in, in Staten Island. And fear that what would be done by the news media, which is always trying to foment division and rage and anger, is some kind of crazy response where you get people mobilized against each other who really aren't, wouldn't be against each other. In this case, uh, the police department and the African-American uh, community or 
however you want to look at it. Because when actually, if you look at the background of who's in the NYPD and the people whose lives they're protecting or the life of Eric Garner and his background, in many cases, it's not that different. So why should these people be adversaries? There's a higher principle uh, which you have to get at. So we said every single human life is sacred. We organized this sing-along of the Messiah. Tragically, the very day we had the sing-along, two police officers were shot to death as they sat in their car. Uh, so from some guy who came up from Maryland. But at any rate, the idea was to avoid this, to take it to a higher level. And what happened is about 100 people showed up on six days notice to sing. And we said, let's organize a chorus. The Schiller Institute, as you heard from LaRouche, had been working um, for a long time under the direction of John Segerson. We had performed uh, back in on the 50th anniversary, 2013, of the Kennedy assassination, the Mozart Requiem, um, that November and then in January in Boston. And uh, we began to pull this project together in New York. And what became very clear is there was such a need for it. And there is no stereotypical person who joined this chorus. Uh, it was completely diverse in terms of age, background, musical training, uh, you name it. But people came together to work on beautiful music. Now we had decided that this year being the 250th anniversary of the birth of Beethoven to actually tackle something which uh, John had discussed on a number of occasions with Lyndon LaRouche, but which is an extremely challenging work for chorus, uh, Beethoven's Missa Solemnis, which people who know it, it's about 90 minutes long. The chorus uh, which premiered it was an extraordinary chorus in St. Petersburg. And here we are, a community chorus um, with every, as I said, all different range of capabilities. And if you know music, if I tell you the ranges of the voices are extreme, that you have basses singing high notes of the tenors, sopranos, singing high notes uh, for many long durations. Um, it's, it's a challenge to say the least, but we decided to tackle it. And then in the midst of that, all of a sudden COVID-19 hits and you say, well, now what do we do? Here we're trying to tackle one of the most challenging choral works ever written, and we can't even get together in the same room to rehearse. So we decided uh, to try and take advantage of this Zoom technology to conduct rehearsals and learn this with the intent that when this, when mankind comes through this hideous period that we are in right now, we will definitely be in need of a celebratory mass dedicated really to the dignity of mankind and what more appropriate thing to do than the Mrs. Solemnus at that occasion and that we would not abandon this. But for people who know, since we don't have uh, 5G, we haven't quite developed excellent systems of communication between the US and Mars so far. Um, you have varying internet speeds. So there's no possible way. It's physically impossible in a rehearsal over the internet for the conductor to ask everybody to sing and then have everyone unmute themselves and you hear people singing at the same time. Does not work. And you can try it at home. Does not work. So talk about, I guess it's a challenge like Beethoven had being deaf. The conductor has to lead a rehearsal at, throughout which he never gets to hear how people are singing. People remain muted, each in their own living room, singing their part. And it's kind of an act of faith and a mental exercise to imagine what's going to be challenging for people and to try and, and learn the parts. So it's been very interesting to say the least and then to put together a recording as i'm going to play just a snip of the beginning of it for you so you have a sense of it you find yourself doing you're forced to do all the things that you say music is not for example 
no two performances of a classical work of art will ever be identical because it's alive, because there's something, there are so many different elements. It's being performed by a few hundred human beings. Each of us is not even the same as we were five seconds ago, let alone a month ago or a year ago. So already it's of necessity going to be different. But in this medium, to do a recording like what you see, everybody has to listen to the same track, which is pre-recorded. We even use what's known as a click track where you have metronomic beats. And you know, uh, Furt Wengler and others said well, about Toscanelli, he's just a beater of time. You never want to perform that way. But of necessity, to be able to have the chorus be coherent, you have to do this. I, I think this is uh, definitely an example of a, a, a coincidence of, of opposites or a paradox. But um, submitting ourselves to all of that difficulty, uh, we, have, we did a number of so-called virtual performances. And actually, I think something human comes across. John did a brilliant job in creating an orchestra, which is not even a real orchestra. It's a synthesized orchestra. So all of these things that you would say are terrible and you should never do this because of the situation we found ourselves in and our efforts to make headway in at least having a glimmer of an insight into this extraordinary work, uh, we did. So um, with that, I think we'll just go, we're just going to hear a couple minutes of the beginning of this uh, piece, and you can find more on the Schiller Institute Chorus website, which is sinycchorus.com. But if we could hear the Curie for a minute now. I'll just uh, leave you with that. I think that what makes you want to listen to a lot more. And I would say that I had a thought the other day, which is I have come to disagree with this saying that everyone says so much, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. I think that the intention is primary. If you have the right intention, even if you 
are forced to use methods which you find are not the best or appropriate or would be wrong in another circumstance. It's the intention which is what allows you to get done what is necessary. Thank you, Diane. Last week, Harley Schlanger gave the lead presentation on the first panel of the Schiller Institute conference, uh, which was called Hang Together or Hang Separately, Free and Sovereign Republics or Digital Dictatorship. His presentation was an in-depth discussion of the infractions of law in the November 3rd presidential election. Uh, Harley does a daily blog which Americans and people around the world consult to figure out what is and is not going on every day. So why was he sitting there 10 years ago with Lyndon LaRouche talking about tensors, scales, tuning of the human voice, cello and piano compositions and counterpoint? What's that got to do with vote fraud, Harley? <laughs> well, look, in less than three weeks, the Congress will meet to count the electoral votes. And this will be a defining moment of a struggle to ensure that the actual vote count is real and legitimate. At this point, we've seen a whole series of, of efforts to bring forward the evidence of fraud, despite the fact that the media says there's no evidence, the courts have said there's no evidence. And I think many people are starting to panic. People who thought that Donald Trump won the election are starting to panic and say, well, what can we do? So in, in a moment of this kind of tension, where we also have geostrategic tensions, we have a pandemic, we have a global financial crash underway. People may be wondering precisely the question you just asked me. What do questions of the method of physical science and classical culture have to do with determining these what seem to be pragmatic issues? Well, this is where you have to go back and look at the actual constitution and the discussion behind the constitution because the US Constitution is a philosophical fight to establish the idea that human beings are capable of self-government and organizing institutions of self-government that can resolve these kinds of very serious problems where there are legitimate disagreements as to how to proceed. But what the United States has always represented is a, at least in its, its institutional form, a belief that through an executive, a president, through a legislative branch and a judicial branch, these kinds of difficult questions can be resolved from a higher standpoint. And what is that standpoint? Well, in the uh, Constitution, we have the preamble, which establishes the idea of the general welfare clause, that what's most important is that while we provide the common defense, we, you know, you can go through these things, a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide the common defense, uh, but promote the general welfare to secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Now, that's not something that's meaning is fleshed out in the actual laws of this country, but as a philosophical concept. And I think what, what I want to discuss is how we've been manipulated around narrow views of being broken into a whole variety of uh, starting points based on race, gender, uh, left and right uh, dualism, which is really run from the top neoliberal, neoconservative. A whole series of things have been done that have made people incapable of fully understanding what had been done to us. Now, with the Trump election showed that people were getting catching on to the fact that there was a fraud being committed by the establishment. And many people rejected that. And that's why Donald Trump was elected. But we've been through a four year struggle when, in which a corrupt, lying media working together with an immoral, corrupt bureaucracy, a permanent bureaucracy in the institutions the former Obama intelligence community, and an external enemy, the British Empire, was able to manipulate us to undermine the presidency of Donald Trump to the point that there could even be a contest in 2020. Now, 
there are still things that can be done. There, there are ways that the, the, there are people who are still willing to mobilize, to organize, uh, calls to state legislatures, uh, calls to congressmen, because the determination now rests with individual state legislators moving their legislatures to rescind or decertify Biden electors and put the Trump electors in. There's also a path through the Congress that could be done. But there are other flanks besides waiting to see if the legal process will work. And we've identified some of them. I'll just briefly reference them. The president himself said that he was considering calling for a special prosecutor to look into the fraud. That would be very advisable. Uh, and there are indications that he may still do that. Also, that the documents that go back to Russiagate, that, that go back to the fraud of the attacks against him, which have been declassified by him, but not yet released to the public because of sabotage by people in his administration. He has to break that logjam and get them out there. And a third step would be the pardoning of Edward Snowden and Julian Assange, who can shed a lot of light on how the security and surveillance state operates, how it was set up and how it uh, violates the Constitution, and also how Russiagate was run, which is something Assange knows a lot about. So these are some steps that could be done. Now, would this be adequate? Well, you need to build up in the population a sense of confidence in their ability to function as a self-governing population. But I think another aspect is we have to make clear, what would a Biden presidency represent? And there are two key points to that. One, an escalation of geopolitical confrontation and likely more wars, including the possibility of a nuclear war. This is Biden's whole history. This is the history of Bush and Obama. President Trump ran for office to oppose this, to break the geopolitical uh, conditions by meeting with Putin, working with President Putin of Russia, working with President Xi of China. And that's what Russiagate targeted. It was a geopolitical assault to keep the United States stuck in the ideas of British imperial geopolitics. And then secondly, the Great Reset, which is a Biden policy. It's not just a Biden policy. This is the policy of the bankers and the financial community, the corporate cartels, which would be at its heart taking the power of government policy, government spending, government programs out of the hands of elected representatives and putting it in the hands of technical experts who would be acting on behalf of central banks. Now, these are two things that everybody could understand as a danger. I think many people already do understand it. So how does it get muddied? What happens? How do, is it that people don't think straight on this? I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. Uh, one is the broader uh, political environment, the climate, the geopolitics. And the other is what we see around the coronavirus crisis, the pandemic. Now, to start with, Let's go to Russia Gate. Many people initially bought the Russia, Russia, Russia line coming from people like Brennan, Clapper, without knowing initially that it came from British intelligence, Sir Richard Dearloff, MI6, the GCHQ, a whole cast of characters who are shared between British intelligence and the CIA, FBI, and NSA. Over the years, the story has come out. And so people at least I mean, I would say probably a significant number of, of true Biden supporters still believe the Russia story, like Nancy Pelosi. But even many Democrats who may have voted for Biden know that Russia did not intervene in the 2016 election. So the whole Russia, Russia, Russia story has been disproven, discredited, even though it's still in the major media. And we're, we're now seeing it emerge again around this hack, this story of a hack where they're saying it's, today Pompeo said it looks like it's definitely Russia. Well, what does he know? He's been a liar on this thing from the time he was CIA director and admitted that the CIA policy is to cheat, steal, and lie. But all of a sudden we see a shift from Russia, Russia, Russia to China, China, China. 
Now we're hearing that the Chinese People's Liberation Army is camped on, across the border in Canada preparing to invade the United States. They've taken over universities, major institutions, the banks. The Chinese are running the banks. This is a fraud. What's being done is to create a second new enemy image of China, the same way they tried to do it with Russia. But keep two things in mind. China and Russia are committed to something that we in the United States are committed to in our best moments. The idea of national sovereignty, that it's the nation that makes its decisions based on what's in the interests of its people, not bankers, not global corporate cartels, but nations themselves. And here's the second point. Who's under attack by the globalists? Who is targeted for regime change? Russia, China, and Donald Trump. The three countries, the most powerful countries in the world have been targeted. So why do people fall for these stories about China, China, China? I know Steve Bannon is out there pushing this. There are a whole bunch of websites and I, I get it all the time from people. Well, the Chinese are communists. Yeah, all right. Where's the evidence? Where do we have evidence that China is involved in the vote fraud? How could the Chinese government shut down the vote count in six states in the United States at the same time and flood the ballots in? And I know there are all sorts of stories about this too, but there also were stories about Trump and Alpha Bank, Trump and prostitutes in a Moscow hotel. These stories are pushed to confuse you and divert you from recognizing the truth. And the truth is, that there was foreign interference in 2016 and in 2020, and it came from the city of London, from the British monarchy, and from British intelligence. And we've covered this extensively for many, many years, going back to when they first were running the operations in the Carter administration, and Lyndon LaRouche purchased a half hour TV time on election eve in 1976 to expose Carter and Brzezinski as pushing policies that would lead to nuclear war if they were allowed to continue. So that's the first point. If we're gullible on these things, then we can be disoriented, we can be diverted and miss the real enemy. Now, the second question then is that of the coronavirus. Now, I know because I do my daily updates and I get a lot of flack from people uh, do you really believe there's a coronavirus? Well, yes, I think it's a scientific fact. Now, the arguments that we see against it are from outliers and people who are disagreeing with, with the medical community. But how many tens of thousands of doctors and medical professionals are putting their lives on the line to protect people who are falling victim of the pandemic? And the idea that, that people who are dying from coronavirus are really dying from heart problems, old age. Well, look, everybody's going to die at some point, but there's an unmistakable reality that the numbers of people dying have gone up and people who are healthy are succumbing to coronavirus. But here's the more important point I want you to think about. Think about the difference between the way the Western nations have dealt with the coronavirus, the pandemic, and the way the Asian nations did. China, where it was first fully uh, uh, exploded, the Chinese stopped it. The South Koreans stopped it. Vietnam has had very, very few deaths. A number of other Asian countries have extremely low uh, incidences, and in many cases, they've, they've completely wiped it out. Why? They used standard methods of medical practice for dealing with pandemics. Testing, mass testing, the idea of uh, contact tracing, the idea of quarantine, the idea if necessary of locking down areas as the Chinese locked down very large cities. These worked. Why was this not done in the West? Well, this is where we get to a psychological factor and a philosophical factor. People in the West have the argument that this is fascism to wear a face mask. Now we're facing real fascism 
in a potential Biden administration with a war policy and the Great Reset, which is preparing to take your banks, take your businesses, take everything from you. That's real fascism. Wearing a mask or staying in quarantine for two weeks is not fascism. It actually comes under a different idea, namely the general welfare, the common good. But in the West, where we've pursued a different approach, we're seeing now a growing level of mortality, a growing incidence of disease. Yes, some of it's because there's more testing, but why do we do more testing? Because more people are dying, more people are getting sick. And I know I hear from people who say, well, the hospital down the street for me is not filled up. Well, look at LA County right now, Los Angeles County, the second largest population area in the country, maybe the largest. Every hospital bed, every ICU is filled. There's a shortage now, a tremendous shortage of medical professionals, and it's getting worse every day. So maybe in your town, that's not the way it is. And maybe you subscribe to a website that tells you it's all a fraud. They're just trying to take away your freedoms. Well, I'll tell you who's taking away your freedom. Your freedom is being taken away by your inability to focus on the bigger picture. Who is out to destroy the United States? Who are the real enemies of this country? And I should add of the countries of Western Europe as well. Now, let's go to one other area, which gets back to the importance of Lyndon LaRouche and science. A pandemic is a disease which comes from a physical process. If you have a a good health care system, if you have adequate professionals, if you have adequate equipment and supplies, if you have access to clean water, hospital beds, and so on, you can deal with these things. In the United States, we saw a consistent attack on the health care system under the Bush austerity policy, and then much worse under the Obama and Obamacare. Uh, I've seen figures of between 2009 and 2016, which is the period of Obamacare getting started. We lost 66,000 healthcare professionals in the United States. Why? Because we went to for-profit uh, healthcare. The Obamacare policy was an insurance boondoggle. It didn't guarantee people health insurance. It guaranteed people almost nothing at a price that was then subsidized to the insurance companies by the government. One of the authors of Obamacare was someone named Ezekiel Emanuel, who is part of the transition team for Joe Biden. Emanuel is the person who came up with the death panel idea, that we decide when we can no longer keep someone alive, when it costs too much to keep them alive, we triage them. You know what that's like? That's the Swedish model. We let the older people or the weak people die. Let them go first and protect the healthy. Well, what happens when you have a step onto that slippery slope? And many people who are genuinely committed to pro-life positions are seeing that erode in our society. What does it mean if you say that, well, if you're over 75, as Emmanuel says, we shouldn't guarantee any resources to keep you alive if you get sick because your, most of your life is over and the high cost of keeping you alive is a drain on the population. Well, that's the moral crisis that Lyndon LaRouche was addressing, a crisis which places a monetary value on human life that says that a grandparent who may still have years ahead of him or her to imbue some wisdom to the next generation it's going to cost too much to keep them alive. Let them go to protect the others. That's the Darwinian survival of the fittest mentality. And that's the mentality of people like Bill Gates, who many people correctly attack for being a genocidalist, but assume that somehow Bill Gates is running a global pandemic to steal your money. The people who are the enemy of the United States are centered around the Davos billionaires, the Silicon Valley social media moguls, the big tech moguls, moguls the media car corporate cartels, 
the general corporate cartels that have been outsourcing for years to make profits, the banks and financial institutions. These are the ones who funded the Biden campaign. These are the ones who funded the whole Russiagate operation. These are the media like the Washington Post and CNN that have still not apologized for four years of lying about Russian hacking and covered up the murder of Seth Rich, which now is emerging as an issue because the FBI admits they've hidden 20,000 pages of documents related to him, including computer uh, emails to WikiLeaks. So we have a lot of work to do in a very short time around this election, but it's not going to be done by a panicked mobilization. It's going to be done by changing the thinking, the way people think so that they're not manipulated. Now, let me get back to this question of, of what is a pandemic defense? Because it's possible there will be other pandemics. A pandemic defense is more healthcare professionals. It's better nutrition. That means taking food policy away from the grain cartels and the, the meat packing cartels uh, and, and putting it back into the hands of family farmers. It means economic policies that support the family farmer. Now, these are the kinds of things that people haven't been thinking about. It means building hospitals in poor areas that have no hospitals. There are whole parts of rural Texas where people have to drive 50 to 100 miles to find an emergency room. And then they get there and they find out it's closed after nine o'clock. So these are questions that are matters of physical economy. Are we producing enough of a surplus, a physical goods surplus, to take care of the needs of our people? The answer is no, we're not. Instead, we're pouring huge amounts of liquidity into the hands of speculators and banks and financial institutions and insurance companies and hedge funds, shadow banking operations, so that they can keep their dead economy alive while they're killing the people who live under their policies. So the, the point here is that we need to think differently about our fellow human beings and about our responsibility as citizens, not just react to the surface, but go deeper. We may still be able to pull this vote fraud fight out, but the most important question is to do it on the right terms so that we're actually preparing a population to function as citizens of a republic that was in the minds of our founding fathers when they wrote the constitution and gave to government the responsibility of protecting and defending the general welfare. The general welfare clause is not socialism. It's the recognition that by giving people independence and freedom, we also expect them to act for the good of the society. Now, that's not communism. That's the American system. So let me stop at that and let's take some questions. Thanks a lot, Harley. What we're going to do, there are several things that we can discuss and need to discuss, uh, which have come up uh, in terms of both some comments and questions. But we have one individual on the phone with us, and I think we should go to him right now uh, because it pertains also to the topic at the panel, first panel. And that's Andrew Smith, who's on with us from Action for Assange. Andrew, are you there? Yeah, I'm here. How are you? Not bad, not bad. Just wanted to know if there was something... Because, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about the case recently, last few 48 hours, in fact, uh, if there's anything that you had that you wanted to say at this point, and then we'll return to our overall discussion. Yeah, we're kind of um, sitting at a precipice here, essentially. Um, what we have is the Trump administration essentially putting out what appears to have been, at least at this point, a head fake about pardoning Julian Assange. Um, following the Stop the Steal events, um, it was actually the last time I was on uh, last Saturday, um, that following Monday, I believe, Trump's pastor released a statement saying that um, there was a pardon coming for Julian Assange. And then within an hour, retracted it, said he had gotten bad information and that he apologized, essentially. Um, since then, the internet has pretty much gone up in arms. Um, people have been forced from 
uh, Rudy Giuliani coming out in support of Julian to Ocasio-Cortez saying, well, there's a lot that has to be considered. Um, so at this point, it's at least alive in the public consciousness. Um, but I want to run through something because I do a, a live show. Is that, is that his end? Um, every two times a week, at the, every time we open the show, what we do is we talk about specifically something that I actually pulled from an idea during the Vietnam era, where um, you would have certain news channels that would literally show you the number of American casualties in Vietnam as the war was unfolding. Um, so what we've done is every week we go through the numbers, is what we call them, but the days of time that have passed for certain events. So it's been 3,661 days of illegal and arbitrary detention for Julian Assange. Um, it's been 616 days since the WikiLeaks founder was trafficked from the Ecuadorian embassy um, after being sold to the United Kingdom for a $4.2 billion loan from the International Monetary Fund to the nation of Ecuador. Um, we have 16 days until Vanessa Baratzer, concierge of the US State Department and the judge ruling over Julian's case is due to make her Ju or J January 4th, 2021 decision on Julian's rendition. Um, we have 100 or 1,285 days of federal incarceration for whistleblower reality winner. Um, we have 2,072 days of freedom uh, for Chelsea Manning. And we have 32 days of freedom, uh, not freedom, but 32 days in a halfway house for Jeremy Hammond. Um, and I think putting, putting that number into perspective, we're going on almost two years now of Julian Assange being held in solitary confinement inside a Belmarsh prison and almost a year of Belmarsh's lockdowns due to coronavirus. That's something that's coming up here in um, the beginning of March, actually, since that prison got almost shut down. Um, we've had, I believe it was over 52 COVID positive patients transferred to Julian Assange's wing inside of Belmarsh prison. Um, and we know that he has a lung condition and that he developed after his period of isolation inside of the Ecuadorian embassy. Um, they've cut the heat to his wing in Belmarsh prison, citing ventilation systems as a possible way to spread coronavirus. So they turned the heat off in Julian's cell and in his cell block. Um, they've given him two blankets, but no additional clothing. Um, so to kind of relate back to what you were talking about just a second ago about the coronavirus, there are very real things that we need to take stands on. Um, and prisons violations of human rights during the coronavirus is absolutely one of them. And Julian's case really highlights that best where you have an innocent man not convicted of anything, the UK formally saying they won't release him on bond because he's held in remand, um, sitting in a prison where they're trying to kill him with biological warfare. Um, so I think that now more than ever is when we need people to actually as individuals uh, make a choice in themselves, whether they wanna live in a free and open society and use those rights that a free and open society has that are enshrined in our Republic, um, or if we're just gonna lay down and allow our government to run roughshod over us, regardless of who gets put into the administration. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we're at, I guess, with, at least with Julian's case. Okay, Harley, you have any response to that? Well, I, I would like to just back up what, what Andrew's saying by making a point that I think people know, but it needs to be said over and over and over. What's his so-called crime? He exposed war crimes. Who are the war criminals? Julian Assange, WikiLeaks, or people like John Brennan who met every Tuesday with Barack Obama and planned bombing civilians with drones, hitting weddings one day and then the funerals the next day. You know, the, the question here is so extreme. And who are the two, two of the key people who insist that Assange has to be kept in prison till he dies? Hillary Clinton and Joe Biden. Now, there's a reason for that because Hillary is a war criminal, what she did in Libya and, and so on. So I, I think for a number of reasons, and, and look, some of the people who have joined the movement for freeing Julian and also pardoning Edward Snowden, now include people like Senator Rand Paul. Uh, Ron Paul has come out on this. Uh, there are an, a number of other people, some military people. Uh, the, the names right now are uh, escaping me, but there have been a number. Well, Oliver Stone, the, the film producer. So 
It's not that people don't know about it. It's the question of how do you move enough people around obvious cases of injustice? And what does it mean if the system won't budge under the uh, effects of these mobilizations? So it, it really does pose a paradox. You know, if we insist that we're a nation of laws and justice, then we will, then it's a clear cut case that not only should Julian and Snowden be pardoned, but also the people who were responsible for their incarceration should come up on charges of war crimes, including people like Tony Blair. So that's, that's what I would say. Yeah, Diane, do you have anything you want to add? Well, I, I mean, for everybody, I was thinking about the document that the Schiller Institute has just released, which you, Dennis Speed, had something to do with uh, writing on the exoneration of LaRouche and a pardon for Assange and Snowden and uh, what's what's involved in the, and the Niemöller point, which Helga Zepp LaRouche was very emphatic about. People don't act. They say, well, I can't take a stand on this because X. Well, everybody who is right now upset about YouTube saying they're going to yank any comments on election fraud or Twitter being able to censor the president of the United States. If you don't like that, then you have to take a stand in this case, because that's what this is about. It's about the American people not knowing the truth. And if you think about what happened uh, around the hack, quote unquote, hack of the DNC computer, somehow no one ever talks anymore about what was the content of Hillary Clinton's emails and that there was an outright illegal th theft of the 2016 Democratic nomination uh, from Bernie Sanders. I don't know if he would have got the nomination or not, but he certainly would have been in a different position had Hillary Clinton not been colluding with other so-called Democrats to, um, to steal the election. No one talks about that anymore. Instead, the topic became Russia. So this is really critical. And I would also say that what they're doing to him reminds me very much about what happened to Mr. LaRouche early on in his incarceration, where he had a medical procedure that needed to be done. And it was clear they were trying to create the conditions where they might induce a heart attack. And um, we had to do a huge mobilization to put a spotlight on that to stop him from being killed in that way in prison, which they do in such a way as to have quote unquote, plausible deniability. So uh, this is extremely important and it's very much related to whether the American people can trust the government of the United States. Well, I'd like to say also just, uh, you mentioned Martin Niemöller, Diane. Uh, a lot of people don't know that story. The people know the quote, you know, first they came for the socialists and I didn't fight because I wasn't a socialist. Then they came for the trade unionists. I didn't fight because I was a trade unionist. Actually, the gypsies were first. And then they came for me, and when they came for me, there was no one there to fight. What they don't know is that Martin Niemöller um, had been a U-2 boat com commander in the First World War. He had refused at the end of the war to turn over his uh, ship to the British, got discharged from the Navy for that, he was a staunch supporter of Adolf Hitler, met with the Ad Adolf Hitler in January of 34, and in that meeting found out, he was by that time a pastor, that he was being surveilled by the Gestapo. And the other pastors were too. So he was shocked because of surveillance into taking a different position. And then he became uh, aware of what was going on. Now, I say that because when we are talking here about the situation we find ourselves in today, the Assange case is one example. Uh, many of us went through this with Lyndon LaRouche and Helga Zepp LaRouche as well, who were the two people who were supposed to be killed on October 6, 1986. Then they were not killed because of uh, actions that Lyndon LaRouche took personally uh, with respect to uh, uh, contacting people in the Reagan administration and making it clear to them that if he were killed, the blood would be on their hands. Um, because of his relationship to that administration, 
during the period of the 1982-83 period, particularly around the SDI, that carried weight. Um, but I'm saying that because the when you don't fight in the earlier circumstances, then what happens is that people suddenly all over the world are, uh, in, if you have enough power to do it, are submitted to gross violations of all forms of law. And this is one case. I mean, Julian Assange is not a citizen of the United States, but we're talking about the president of the United States having to pardon Julian Assange. Well, how does that exactly work? But nonetheless, that's a, that's a demand you must raise in this bizarre circumstance. People from Pennsylvania last week, and Andrew, you were part to participate in, participant in that panel, uh, who were just normal citizens who saw vote fraud. They're shocked. They're stunned. They, they, they saw things that they know are illegal, that they testified to, and they can't get anyone to listen to them, even though they're told by the people that they reported to, including legal authorities, yes, you're right. But it doesn't rise to the level of what we would like to think of as, you know, actionable. And so I think uh, this case in particular, uh, which when you say that you have Giuliani calling for Giuliani of Giuliani time fame in New York for all those New Yorkers to understand what I'm talking about, he says Assange should be released. But Ocasio-Cortez has reservations what I like about the present situation, as tragic as it is and as, as lethal and brutal as it is, is a lot of things are coming, becoming clear to people. There have been a lot of people who have been acting hypocritically for a long time, and a lot of that is now beginning to come out. So uh, if you have anything else you'd like to say, go right ahead. Uh, Absolutely. Could I talk a little bit of, just for a moment about the idea of the pardon? Sure. Because I don't, I don't think it's the best option. I don't even inherently think it is the most appropriate, but I think it is an option. Um, it would be one of not even the first times in history where they call a preemptive pardon, so to speak. Um, there's a lot of implications with pardons. A lot of people, and legally it almost is saying, yes, you're guilty, but we'll let you free. Um, I think the best avenue would be to drop the charges with extreme prejudice and then proceed to support bills that overturn the Espionage Act or amend the Espionage Act for public interest defense and such. Um, but the pardon, while it's not the mainstay, while it should not be like our flag of victory and the hill that we're gonna die on, it is massive um, because there's so many people now that from every side of the political spectrum that have been forced to talk about this. And like you said, it forces, uh, people out into the light. It shines a spotlight down from the tower that Julian had been in uh, for so long to illuminate not even the good people and the bad people, but the totalitarianist slanting people and the, the liberty, not liberal or libertarian, but liberty focused people. And the, the thing that I advocate for the most, um, and this just to kind of frame it, is coming from a place of understanding the intelligence community's attack on activists. Um, whether it's from stuff that happened in Michigan recently, the Occupy movement, the, the anti-pipeline movements from across the country, whether it's Bundy or Standing Rock, um, the intelligence communities, whatever letter they decide to send in there, um, does infiltrate, does try to bring organizations down. Um, so what we've advocated for is one by one citizen activation, essentially. Be the person individually that reaches out to your city council. Be the person individually that walks down the street and puts up uh, posters on telephone poles or hands out flyers or makes phone calls um, or knocks on people's doors and says, hey, I just want you to know what's happening with whatever idea, whether it's about Julian, about the election, what have you. Because if we can get 10 million signs across the country that say this election was stolen, this has to stop, that's more powerful than any Twitter post. Because the way you censor in real life is with overt violence. So if we, as a collective of people that want to proliferate truthful information to the public, we have to think of Paul Revere style and the Flyer Brigade style, um, where it's one person doing the work in their community that doesn't 
necessarily try to build local power, but just raise awareness around issues. Um, we call it the idea of decentralized activism, where you know something's wrong, so you do what you can with the time, money, and resources that you have to correct it in any way possible, whether it's one person putting up a poster or trying to schedule a meeting with someone from the United Nations. Okay, well, we want to thank you for that. I don't know if uh, hardly have anything else. Uh, I'll just point out that uh, similar to the uh, Assange is, is, is situation you Bruce brought it out, um, uh, President Donald Trump cannot exonerate Lyndon LaRouche because the president can't vacate a legal decision made by a court. He can pardon Lyndon LaRouche, for example, and say, well, the reason I'm doing this is because I don't think he should have been convicted in the first place. Uh, those kinds of things, and just so everybody's clear about these things. And I think what's important is that we're in a moment where people are saying, well, this is a great crisis of the Constitution. No, actually, it's just a crisis of the mentality of the people of the country. Okay, You have the right in the United States to redress grievances under all circumstances at all times. It's a constitutional right. It's not spelled out in some amendment. It's spelled out in the principle of the document, and it's spelled out in the Declaration of Independence as all, and also that in, if you have a long train of, of abuses and usurpations, which um, pursue invariably the same objective, uh, which invents a design to reduce people under absolute despotism, it is the right and the duty of the people uh, to throw off not the form of the government, but that oppression. Uh, and that's where we are, I think, uh, today. You're welcome to certainly stay with us. We're going to uh, shift the conversation slightly, uh, but stay right there if you want. And Diane, I think you have some questions that you were going to uh, pose to Harley and us. Sure. Yes. Um, here's one I'm going to take, and you can say if you have more. Well, those two that are related. Uh, what will be the recourses we have available if med medical vaccine mandates are implemented? Three, will we be able to achieve responsibility and liability for the vaccine companies and politicians in power who work in government and these companies for the damage they have already done? Now, I know that there is absolutely legitimate reason to not trust the mega pharmaceutical companies or the medical insurance companies because they, as Harley was talking about earlier, um, have converted people's hardship that is illness into a way to rip people off and make a profit on the other hand there is i think the way to deal with this vaccine mandate is get the vaccine uh if you think about diseases like measles you could have a similar argument today well measles is really only deadly to infants and small children is their life that precious i mean and by the way, measles is highly contagious, so it lasts in a room for hours after the infected people have left the room. So you need a very high rate of vaccination, like up to, I think, 95% of, or something to eradicate the disease. If you don't get that level of vaccination, then you have something that can break out all over the place and kill small children. Similarly, with the this vaccine, unless you want to argue that it's okay for millions of elderly people and people with pre-existing conditions to have their life endangered by your freedom and not being vaccinated or not wearing a face mask, then we should do what is necessary to eradicate the disease. And I think uh, the trials of tens of thousands of people have indicated that this vaccine is extremely effective right now and also uh, extremely safe. So that's the first thing, but I'll stop and see if Harley or Dennis have anything they want to say. Harley? Well, I'll just say one thing, which is uh, I think back to the early 50s with the polio vaccine. And that was a different time. Now, maybe it was because we, at that point, didn't have the same kind of money-grubbing, corrupt pharmaceutical industry that we have today. But we also had a trust in science and doctors. And I, I think one of the things that's having an erosion in our society is skepticism about medical professionals 
that are coming in some cases from medical professionals, but are being taken as proof that they're, they're presenting those people who say coronavirus is serious are running a con operation or on the payroll of Bill Gates or the big pharma. You know, I, I know many doctors and there are many physician associations, medical associations where people are committed to and willing to put their life forward, first responders to save lives. And the cynicism and skepticism is just being fanned by the fact that we've seen so much corruption and fraud. And I think people have to step back and, and actually think about why they're responding the way they are. Now, add to that what I brought up earlier, which is that in China, in South Korea, in Vietnam, and, and several other countries in Asia, people didn't rebel against masks and they brought the disease under control. You know, there was a, a German politician who said, it's as though some people are saying that the elderly should die so I can have my afternoon at a cafe. And I think this is where we have to go back to this idea of the general welfare clause and the common good. And there are certain sacrifices that are made for the whole public. And, you know, for example, a draft in wartime. You know, in World War II, people lined up to go to war. Many volunteered, but many were drafted and served. So, you know, there's a, a shift away from this idea, which is fed by neoliberalism and greed and the, the idea that everybody should have a right to do what they want. This is part of the counterculture that was introduced again. I, you know, let, let's be clear. It came from the, the Britain. Dennis, you can talk about that perhaps. But the counterculture, which said, my pleasure is the most important thing in the world. And that's what shaped the baby boomer generation. And I think that's part of what we're coming up against today. Well, my own response to this is um, a little different. Uh, I believe that the United States population is being played. And uh, it happened around the president. It happened around Donald Trump. Donald Trump had made it very clear he considered Xi Jinping to be a personal friend of his. He'd had a meeting with Xi Jinping in the, White House, uh, the mar lago uh, He'd gone to China. Uh, clearly, he was working with China, also with Russia, on North Korea. Uh, and there were people that didn't like that. They didn't like that because they knew the deeper history of the United States' relationship with China, going back to the time of Abraham Lincoln. It's a history that nobody likes to talk about because if you talk about it, then you'll come up with British intelligence and you'll come up with the fact that Abraham Lincoln's war of 1861 to 65 uh, was a war which invented the transcontinental railroad as a solution to the real war, which was against the British Empire. The British Empire was financing the South. They owned over 60% of the plantation property titles in the South. What you were dealing with was something completely different than people think. It was the French Empire and British Empire fighting the United States using the South as a proxy. The purpose was simple. It was to divide the United States. That's why Lincoln, of course, never called it until, I think, the Emancipation Proclamation, the Civil War. He always referred to it as a rebellion because he recognized what it was. And what happened was that uh, Lincoln recognized the nation of China, even when China was completely occupied by the British during the Opium War, the Second Opium War. The British sold poison to the Chinese. The Chinese tried to revolt, and the British took them over. They subjugated them. Anyway, Lincoln rep rec recognized them, and he sent an ambassador as soon as he got in, 1861, Anson Burlingame, who was an abolitionist. And he sent another abolitionist, uh, Cassius Marcellus Clay, to Russia. So this is a deeper history, and it's important because what actually happened was the president got bushwhacked, got bamboozled, not by China, got bamboozled by the State Department, by people like Pompeo, by other people who basically played a certain kind of race card around the Chinese. They didn't play the one that people are thinking, I mean, which is just the yellow peril. They played a different race card. They knew that the Chinese... In the case of the coronavirus, there were various things that went on there. 
And they, they had to, and what had needed to be done was a consultation between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump, an urgent consultation. Now, we don't know the details. What we know is that it didn't happen. And then what occurred was that the ability of the United States and China to work together to stop the spread of the virus into Africa, to stop the spread of the virus into South America, wasn't there. Now, the African question was very important because the Chinese are all over Africa, uh, and which is, which, as, is, as is the United States, which has military in 26 nations out of the 54 in Africa. But this isn't talked about a lot, but it's the case. So if you were going to stop the virus from mutating, and we now have some indications from South Africa that we have mutations in the virus, you were going to have to arrest it quickly in the United States and everywhere else. You had to have something of a highly disciplined nature happen early on. When that was sabotaged and the president was convinced, I gotta, he's got to turn against China because China screwed him. China, you know, bamboozled him. China didn't tell the truth. Once that started, it meant that what you were going to have is an unregulated situation. Maybe not just in the United States. That wasn't so much it. It was that you'd get an unregulated spread in the countries that didn't even have healthcare systems. I mean, they don't have running water in many of these locations or electricity. So, so once that happens, you're going to get a mutation. Now, why would this be done? What, who, who gains from that? Well, British imperial policy is to reduce the population of the globe by several billions of people. There is nothing that does that better than a plague. And especially if for the people that you really want to do that. So they decided to march through the United States using uh, this approach and to the point that the president starts talking about the Kung flu. And then what happens is the people in the United States just take off with that. At that point, the whole thing takes off into an entirely different direction and the Steve Bannons of the world take things over. And what happened was we got a situation where people began to break the lockdown. You can't keep a country locked down permanently. And they began to break the lockdown for many different reasons. But I think that the issue is uh, very specific. Let's just take this issue of China. People say, well, China did this and China did that. How about Vietnam? Vietnam fought the Chinese for 2,000 years. They have an 870-mile border with China. They got SARS and they got avian flu from China before. Vietnam, as Americans ought to know, does not have the world's greatest medical system. They have 100 million people, so it's not 10 million people like Sweden. They have 35 people dead there and they got 8,000 people dead in Sweden. Even if you say the Vietnamese are lying, maybe, maybe they're lying about their figures. You know, they're communists too. They, they got 10 times as many people dead. Well, no, no. How about 100 times as many people dead? Well, then they would still have one-third the people that Sweden had. And nobody ever talks about the Vietnamese as a model. Well, well wait a minute. Let's say that they have 1,000 times more people. They're hiding 999 bodies for every dead person. They would still have a third of the rate of death of the United States. So here's Vietnam, which has fought China forever. How come we're not talking to the Vietnamese about what they did? What, what's going on here? What we have is that people have been bamboozled. That's my view. And I think that the president is not the person that has to be blamed for that, though I don't think he did a good job in stopping it. I think that the thing was a manipulation. It was a manipulation against his attempt to establish in a relationship with another world leader, Xi Jinping, as he tried to do with Vladimir Putin. And we know how that's been manipulated the entire time through this Russiagate hoax. So my, my view is that people have to decide to face the truth. Stop talking about things that don't make any sense. Our friend Kildare Clark, who's a doctor in New York, who is as skeptical as you can get, says, look, I don't know. I think there are a lot of problems with the vaccine uh, uh, you know, process and so on. But on the other hand, people are dying. People should take it. What we really need to have is extensive research protocols. We need to have a crash program for public health. We need to involve a lot of people in public health, including young people, and we have to stop the spread by basics, whether that's masks, washing hands, and other things, which we still don't have. So, I mean, that's a long answer, but the reason I decided to give it is, frankly, I'm, 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 I've completely had it 
with this whole discussion around, quote, China as the source of this, uh, when people don't want to recognize that if you compare us to Vietnam, which of course we fought in a criminal war against, which killed 55,000 of our own citizens and destroyed our country culturally, we still can't learn the, the lesson from that. So every year we kill more people who are Americans than Vietnam killed of Americans every single year at this point through drugs. And so that's the, what I think is the answer. I think we have a cultural problem and we should face it. Now you had a question, Diane, and this is also for you, Harley. Um, this is sort of a, a, a combination of th two people who lasted, which is, I'm still not getting the role of music in politics. I applaud what your chorus did in performing in New York, but why do you say that music is essential to solving the problem of the election, the, the presidential election, or any other specific political problem? Should I go? Yeah, well, you started you with have <laughs> You have to be able to think. And the one thing that, um, especially singing in a chorus or frankly, even being in an instrumental ensemble, is that you discover that the universe does not work in pairwise linear interaction. In fact, even if you are singing what you think is a solo uh, line of melody by yourself, the truth of the matter is that there is a relationship, there is a harmonic relationship between the tones, and I hate to use that word because this relationship exists prior to the existence of tone. That is, it's not necessary to even hear to know that this is going on, and there are extremely beautiful essays, a couple of things um, from Helen Keller on her experience of listening to Beethoven's Ninth Symphony on the radio by putting her hand, uh, feeling the vibrations. And also, I forget uh, what they were singing, but a singer uh, singing something. And she just was feeling the, the um, like she did lip reading and had a sense of what the passion was that was emerging from this singer. But there's, what you discover is that there's why something sounds or creates a sense of instability or a sense of resolution has to do with relationships that already exist in your own mind. So a so-called single note is not a note. And if you want to get at what's happening right now in the country, what happened with this election fraud is not the compilation of the so-called facts. That's a lot of the problem of our legal system right now. It's what Scalia did with the words, as opposed to the question of intent. Um, so you say, well, we have this, we have, I don't know how many thousands of affidavits from people who witnessed very peculiar and illegal things occurring. And someone says, well, since Biden supposedly won by 7 million votes and we only have 5,000 affidavits, then that really doesn't um, demonstrate that you have a case. And a legalist, Aristotelian like Scalia uh, might go along with that argument. But the question is, is there a provable intent to commit fraud? And why would that be occurring? And how would you demonstrate it? And that is something of a completely different matter. I would also say that our society has become extremely atomized, partly not just since COVID, which has definitely made it worse, but relationships among people, uh, among human beings. People would rather play on their cell phone and uh, have friends, whether real or imagined, on Facebook that interact, than interact with other human beings. So 
when you think about the civil rights movement or the cohesion of a group that was marching together singing there was a sense of solidarity that you knew that justice was more powerful than injustice what you were up against now people are very much isolated and and larouche organizers would see it in the field all the time you set up a sign that says um defend Trump, stop the coup, jail Robert Mueller, uh, whatever our signs uh, were saying at the height of the Russia gate. And people would come over and say, I think I'm the only person in this town. And they wouldn't even dare to speak above a whisper. And if someone, the wrong person came by, they'd sort of turn their back and pretend they were just looking. I mean, you know, that kind of fear. So this involvement in classical musical composition, whether as a performer, an audience member, helps for you to be able to have an understanding of the situation you're in and also the kind of quality of courage because you know that when you are standing for something which is true, you are not, that is not you yourself, but you are resonating with a certain principle of justice. Okay, Harley. Yeah, I, I think the, this gets to the question of what is an artist. It's not just music, but it's classical art, uh, which is poetry, uh, uh, sculpture. It, it's uh, drama. You know, the the person to look at in this is is Friedrich Schiller, and this is the example Helga always uses of Schiller's work on himself. You know, in spite of distractions, in spite of illness, in spite of poverty, in spite of living in a time where he had very little freedom. He had to put all that beside, be behind him when he worked, when he wrote, and look for that which is the ideal potential in man. And you have to find that as an artist in yourself. Today, because of Hollywood, we're convinced that artists are neurotic. You know, they smash guitars. They, you know, the immortal beloved example of Beethoven where he trashes a motel room, including the piano, like someone from The Who or something like that. That's, that's just not true. The artist has to develop all the sensibilities that come from a true love of his fellow man, his or her fellow man, including the ability to overcome the divisions in society and, and the, their own neurotic attachments to be able to inspire in others that quality of love. And if you take that away, uh, if, if you take that away from a society where people think that the only thing is that I've got to get a bigger piece of the pie for myself, uh, when you destroy education so that people are not reading Shakespeare anymore in, in high school, when there are very few choruses or orchestras uh, in the high schools, where people are not in an environment where these great ideas become a matter of personal passion to be able to find in yourself something in common with the creative impulse of a great composer or a great writer, then we suffer from that. And I, I think that's the characteristic of society today. You, know, you go back to the to John F. Kennedy, just as an example, who had uh, uh, Pablo Casals in the White House. He had Robert Frost coming in. I mean, Kennedy had a, a, an idea of real culture. And instead, today, we, we see culture as country Western music and the degradation of man. You know, my, my wife ran off with my best friend and I miss him. You know, that, that kind of culture is a culture of victimization as opposed to the Promethean that we see in a Beethoven who said, in spite of my deafness, in spite of the problems that causes me, in his Heiligenstadt Testament of 1802, he says, I'm going to do everything I can to bring out all that God gave me as a capability to bring beauty into this world. And it's that quality of great art, which we should make something that, that moves us and that we want to spread with others. Okay. I think we're pretty much, we're coming to the conclusion. We have, I have something, I think, Diane, you've got something, and then we'll take our concluding remarks. This is from Fran from East Orange, and she asked this question. There's a lot of discussion of herd immunity. 
Could you define herd immunity and how is that, does that correlate with the vaccine? Now, my own response to that, but I think we probably should give a different one is, herd, we used to call herd immunity stupidity. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it, it's the case that people may seem to be immune to being made smarter, but you can actually vaccinate against stupidity. Um, but Harley, if you want to say anything about that to be well, very simply, herd immunity starts with the idea that you're going to let a certain sector of the population die off and let the, the other people who are healthier have the disease and, and develop the antibodies and the immune system so they don't die from it. You know, it, it does start with this idea that you can't protect everyone. The Swedish model, which was really big for a while among some uh, neoconservatives and neoliberals in the United States who said, look how great Sweden's doing. The actual numbers in Sweden are far worse than in Norway and, and the other Scandinavian countries. They're essentially sacrificing a section of the population in order to build up the immunity. And this is, uh, this is really part of what you were talking about, Dennis, in terms of this population reduction policy, the survival of the fittest. The fit will survive. Everyone else has to take a chance. That's not acceptable. Okay, Diane? Yeah, I just, there is an idea, I mean, that a certain amount of the population becomes immune. The point is that uh, they have figures, there's a certain threshold of how rate, quickly a disease will spread, and that depends on how many people an infected person infects in turn. So you achieve what they call herd immunity when some high percentage, I said in the case of measles, 95% of the population, because it's so very contagious, has to be immune to the disease, in that case through a vaccination. So the point is, if you wanted to have something like herd immunity, then you would vaccinate the population, because if, and I think they're talking about 70 or 80%, some percentage of the population would have to have either A, already been infected and recovered from the disease, or have the vaccine to attain a level where you could not get the transmission and multiplication of the spread of the disease. So if you're a barbarian, you call for it like a natural thing and you just allow massive, allow massive numbers of death deaths of your uh, less fit people, or you achieve it through a scientific breakthrough like a vaccine, which is effective, and that prevents the spread of the virus. Okay. Um, sort of that's actually the Bolsonaro approach is the one that you indicated, which is to just let people die and, you know, hope for the best, which is that as many of them die as possible. Uh, you have something, Diane, that... Uh... Yeah, I think you and Harley will have some fun with this um, because I, it's news to me. I didn't realize that our friend Don Fowler, uh, former DNC chairman, has passed away. And there's a, I guess, obituary in the Baltimore Sun, which references LaRouche. Um, and I'm sorry that he didn't repent because I think he's in a terrible place right now. But at any rate... Uh, this person writes, yesterday's print edition of the Baltimore Sun carried an obituary for former DNC chair Don Fowler. It included the following passage. Part of his DNC tenure also included defending an unsuccessful legal challenge from candidate Lyndon LaRouche, whom Fowler said was not a quote unquote bona fide Democrat due to what he said were anti-Semitic expressions and other activities instructing uh, state parties not to vote for him. Fowler's legal argument against LaRouche's candidacy that the Democratic Party was in effect a private club, and those words were used by the judge in the case, I was present for that hearing, were later exploited by Hillary Clinton and her actions against Bernie Sanders as under the interpretation of the earlier LaRouche candidacy, the DNC insiders and not the voters control the process, i.e., this is the person who wrote this in, Sanders was LaRouche. 
So Dennis and Harley, you both probably have some things to say about this. Yeah, I'm going to let Harley take this one because this is, uh, uh, you know, in Texas, they had very specific Democratic Party laws, which he may remember. Uh, and he was down there for a long time. So why don't you take it, Harley? Well, look, I, I think the if we look at the 2020 election, we see the legacy of Fowler. Look what happened on the Democratic side. You had Kamala Harris, who had lots of money, lots of media coverage, couldn't win a vote. It was in terrible shape and had to drop out early. You had Joe Biden, who was going nowhere. You know, his, his campaign, his candidacy was, was dead in the water. He couldn't finish sentences. Uh, now, it was a terrible field as a whole. But all of a sudden, there was an intervention from the outside. And, and people say it was Obama. Personally, there may have been other people who were with Obama, the money crowd, and so on. But all of a sudden, Joe Biden becomes unstoppable. This is the private club. You know, the, the, and it's a private club that, that you and the rest of us don't belong to. And in the case of LaRouche, what was their quarrel with LaRouche? Their quarrel was with the Democratic voters who were voting for LaRouche. You know, the ones who were voting for us in, in Illinois and in, in Texas, we had lots of people who were getting 30, 40 percent of the vote. Uh, LaRouche won, I think, 26 percent of the vote in Arkansas in one of the elections. I don't remember the exact year, but they did everything they could to deny him delegates using this argument that it's a, a private club. Now, if that's the case, how does it get federal funds? So, you know, what, what Fowler represented was a fall guy for the Wall Street crowd that took over the Democratic Party in the mid-1980s. You know, remember, Democrats in the 70s were against the CIA. They were against the injustices of the FBI. They were against the policies of fattening Wall Street fat cats at the expense of the population. Look at the Democratic Party today. It's essentially the party of the FBI, the CIA, and Wall Street, along with a large portion of the Republican Party. So you might say we have two private parties. That whole thing was broken by Donald Trump, and that's why they hated Trump so much. So that, I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, I think that's very good. So we're at the end. So I'd just like to ask if there are any uh, matters or been reflecting kind of on the entirety of what we presented here. And let me start with you first, Diane, and then we'll go to Harley. Well, I think that uh, people should absolutely not give up hope. Don't give up fighting for the truth in the U.S. election, but don't give up the idea that we can actually bring down this entire treasonous apparatus. The fact that there is such an incredible resonance around the case of Assange and that people feel very passionately about it as they ought to, I think indicates that we're ripe to bring an end to this rotten, treasonous apparatus that assassinated the Kennedys and Martin Luther King and Malcolm X that ran 9-11, that framed up LaRouche, and that is right now trying to prevent the United States from having a constitutional election. Uh, so. I, and I think if you listen to Beethoven's music, and you should do it every day, which I have a hard time doing, I'll confess, but if you do it every day, it definitely puts you in the right mindset to do what's ever required to make sure that we succeed. Thanks. Harley? Let me take it one step further. It's not just the American people who are reacting against this establishment, the, the corrupt criminal conspiracy that we've seen dominating politics for two decades uh, or, or longer. Uh, actually, you can go back to the assassination of John F. Kennedy and then the end of the Bretton Woods system in 71 and see that there's been an increasingly insane establishment that's uh, now using open censorship and, and vote fraud and all kinds of other practices to keep in power because there's a upsurge in the population against that new interest in the Constitution, interest in the, the history of America. But it's not just in the United States. It's all over Europe. It's all over the world. We see countries in Africa that are poor but are starting to develop, that are establishing space programs. 
We, we look in Asia and we see the excitement about the Belt and Road Initiative, which is part of the reason the uh, Wall Street and London establishment is freaking out. But much of the world is looking to the horizon and to a better time ahead. Whereas in the United States, we're caught up in squabbles in the mud. And I, I think that we have the opportunity, as you were saying, Diane, now to get out of that. And that's what people should look to as, as what's positive. When I was watching that, that video, the interview I did with Lyndon LaRouche 10 years ago, there are two things that struck me. One is for Lynn, talking about tensors and, and Gauss's work on the series, these were questions of great importance for everybody, for politics. And secondly, it reminded me that there were times in the past that I knew more about things than I know today and I've got to get back to work on some of these things because these are important ideas. All right. Well, thank you both uh, for today's discussion. Also, Jason Ross, who obviously played an important role, and Andrew Smith, who gave us that report from Action for Assange. So we're at the conclusion, and so we'll say a few things here concerning where we stand in the United States. Uh, we are in a situation where people are insisting that this is a constitutional crisis. We say that is not the case. The crisis is a moral crisis of the American people who have to decide whether or not it is their role to act as citizens in a way that Beethoven act as a, acted as a, a composer. That is to say, in a condition in which he seemed to be bereft of the primary sense that you need as a musician, your hearing. He was able to nonetheless hear the future to the extent that he was able to compose music greater than any that had been composed up to that time. This doesn't mean, and it's not in any way, denigration to a Bach or something, or Mozart, or somehow the pieces were, quote, better. That's not the point. The point was that he found it within himself, within his capacities, to transcend what seemed to be the conditions that would have constrained him. They did not. The conditions that you think constrain you as the American people concerning the presidency of the United States and the theft of that presidency do not constrain you. This does not mean that you are then therefore required to abolish the Constitution in order to save it, okay? Like destroying the village in Vietnam by burning it down in order to save it. You're not required to do that. You're required to, no, hear the music behind the Constitution, hear the actual in, uh, cadence, if you will, of freedom that it offered, which is freedom through reason. It's freedom through responsibility. And in this case, if you have a situation where the, uh, not only the president, but many, many citizens all over the United States are saying there is no way to any longer trust the integrity of the electoral process, then what's being said to you is that there's no way to any longer trust the integrity of government as a whole. That is a crisis. Now, the actions that have to be taken require a certain kind of courage. And the problem involved is that to find the courage is not just an act of will. It's not a Nietzschean triumph of the will that's needed. What's needed is to go back and consider what it means not merely to be an American, but to be a human being. And for that, Beethoven's music is not only solace, it's a starting point. Uh, and it's something that everybody can do. People can think like Beethoven in the sense that Beethoven wrote, if you will, the music of the future for you and for this kind of moment. So we ask that you uh, think about what we said, um, and uh, you might want to review our panel from, uh, from the conference from the last uh, week. Uh, the Schiller Institute conference uh, course has its presentations and uh, performances. I think you can also go to the site and find those. We want to thank everybody that did write in questions uh, and just say, think like Beethoven, and we will see you next week, the day after Christmas. <laughs>